season three of the Power Play Show. Can you believe it? Thank you so much for your continued support. And I encourage you to keep listening and watching the Power Play Show each Thursday, wherever you subscribe to podcasts or on our YouTube channel or by visiting thepowerplayshow.com. On our season three premiere, I'm kicking things off in the tradition of the Power Play Show with my friend, renowned artist, Rob Stull. We discuss his work, how hip hop continues to influence his life, and we remember his father, renowned architect, Donald Stull. That's coming up next on season three of the Power Play Show. From the studios at Hull Bay Productions, this is the Power Play. Welcome to season three of the Power Play Show. I'm your host, Tonya McGrath, and I am so excited to kick off this season in the same way, which is now a tradition for this show, with my guest and friend, renowned artist Rob Stahl. You'll remember last year we discussed Rob's work being featured at the Museum of Fine Arts with the Mural Project and donning the facade of the building, the first ever local artist to do so. But what you may not have known is he was also mourning the passing of his father, Donald Stull, the pioneering architect of the historic firm Stull and Lee Incorporated. Mr. Stull's work can be seen throughout the Boston area with landmarks such as the Roxbury Community College, the Harriet Tubman House, the Ruggles MBTA station, and Boston Police Headquarters, to name a few. We'll discuss Mr. Stull's legacy in a bit, but first, my guest for my season three premiere, my friend, Rob Stull. Welcome. Hey, T. <laughs> How Hello, are you? you? This time, happy new year. Happy New Year. Yeah, this this is the new year. This is the first show of the new year. I'm so glad that you continue to do this with me because um, it just for me, it just gets me going on the right foot. We talk about things that we love about. We talk about creating. We talk about building. We talk about um, just the wonderful things that you're doing, which I'm always excited because I'm one of your biggest fans. So thank you. Thank you for coming on again. You're quite welcome, and thank you very much for having me. This is definitely, without question, a tradition. Yes, it is. Absolutely. You need to keep it going. <laughs> so 2021, still in a pandemic, still craziness in the world. How are you? How have you been coping through all of this? What's your life been like? Yeah, I think uh, New Year's sort of ushered in the official start to year three of the pandemic. And... Um, I think a lot of those things that completely terrified us the first time around when we didn't know anything about it and before vaccines and all that, um, it's sort of becoming uh, commonplace. Uh, and in some ways, I guess that's good. Uh, and in other ways, it's, it's awful <laughs> because um, this is still so foreign and uh, there's still so much that we don't know about it. And we're just trying to show the world as best we can. And, um, and and I'm no different. I kind of went to the extreme at the very onset of it. Um, and I did a whole lot of things that I don't do anymore. Like I had a whole routine every time I was away from the house that I won't get into, but you can kind of use your imagination, you know, the worst stuff um, to the extremes of, uh, you know, disinfecting my clothing and, and things yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. I've kind of relaxed a little bit, but but uh, they sort of become part of my daily routine, you know, and I'm sure other people have similar routines. Um, and, and I'm not surprised. I kind of am, but I'm not surprised uh, just how commonplace a lot of these these things that were so foreign and terrifying about a year and a half ago are, are just our way of life now. It, it is a little nuts. And I don't know about you, but for me, um, it has affected my work actually in a positive way because I can spend more time with myself thinking, creating, building, doing this thing. So I wonder how has the pandemic affected you in your work that you do? Yeah, we that, we touched on that in our last conversation. Um, it's overall been positive. Um, there are uh, 
no heartbreaking elements to uh, the pandemic there. I, I don't know anybody who hasn't experienced loss on some level um, within the past couple of years. Um, but creatively, it, uh, it still uh, remains to be, because I mean, things have changed a little bit. I think we're kind of venturing out a little bit more, um, but uh, you know, this, this, this virus is just sort of letting us know with each new strain um, that it's here to stay. Yeah, it is. It's, it's our, and I, I know that this saying gets tired, but it's the new normal. And, yeah. um, and I think that you're right. I think that we just have to all embrace it. Um, those who are continuing to try and fight what this is and uh, not wear masks and not get vaccinated and my rights and my this and you know at the end of the day it's it's the human race and we all have to live together so um yeah it, it it's 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 crazy but it is what it is look i want to jump in to talk about some of your work um some of the projects that you have going on i wanted to start with this this exciting project the fenway art walk a self-guided walking tour of public art showcasing the works of renowned international and local Fenway artists. Talk about this. This sounds just amazing. Where is it and how did this whole thing come about? Well, it was a temporary installation um, on uh, Richard Ross Way at Van Ness Street. And if if, uh, people aren't familiar where that is, it's literally walking distance, steps away from Fenway Park. And it's an annual event. Right across the street from my installation uh, is a piece by Dragon, a uh, uh, muralist and artist from Tokyo and New York, and uh, just an amazing piece. It was sort of inspired by uh, Sea Walls, which was uh, done in conjunction with the New England Aquarium, and that's to bring attention to the plight of uh, marine life in our oceans. So my piece and the Fenway Art Walk isn't like directly a part of Seawalls, but um, Dragon's piece was was done in the in the in the spirit of the Seawalls event. And Shepherd Ferry, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with him. Yeah, he did the huge side of the New England Aquarium that everybody's putting down there. He's old bay giant and. All of that stuff, and I'm, I'm sure everybody knows who he is. Um, he was was a participant in that market 27. Um, Victor Canones, he had a piece. So um, this was sort of done in the in in the inspiration of of that. So to kind of and it kind of jumped off of, or it kicked off around the same time. So it was another uh, attraction that the city was offering at the same time that they were doing the, the seawall stuff. So, uh, but what's different is that uh, all of the pieces, like you mentioned, are within walking distance of each other. So, like Dragons is right across the street from mine. Um, there's another one right at the tip of that nest that's sort of right across from, I think that might be Sweet Green or whatever that is. Um, and I'm not sure the cross street that cuts across but it's adjacent to uh, Longwood Avenue. So um, those are just three right there that are in immediate proximity of each other. And um, like I, I, uh, uh, Adam and Co. and Samuels and Associates had approached me um, about uh, if I was interested to participate in it. And my piece was a temporary install because there's uh, a restaurant that's gonna go in that same space um, later on this year. But the idea was to um, to have that corner, which is heavy traffic. You think about it when they're having a ball game at Fenway, yeah. or even the concerts that they do up there. There's no way you can miss it. So um, there was a potential workshop element that was attached to it. And um, I immediately thought of my involvement with the Elliott School. Um, art school in Jamaica Plain that I've been teaching at for about quite 10 years. And um, I teach drawing classes there and comics classes, and they have a really great program called Team Bridge up there. 
and um, co-faculty and the director of Deep Bridge, uh, woman Allison uh, Crummy Moses. She's a director of the program. And um, we thought it would be a cool uh, idea to try and um, pose uh, an element of it to the students. And um, before I talk about that, um, the inspiration for my piece was I was taking um, imagery and symbolism from the work that I uh, produced with, uh, for my residency at the Museum of Fine Arts last year um, in, coordination, in coordination with the Basquiat exhibit, right in the future, Basquiat and the Hip Hop Generation. And just to kind of recount, I did a, uh, a response to the exhibit and paid homage to five artists from the show. And within those pieces, I had little graphic elements, almost sort of scattered about in collage form. Mm -hmm. I took those same elements because the exhibit was still up and running at the time, it's since closed. Um, and my idea or my thinking was that people would make connections between um, anybody that had attended the exhibit would make connections um, uh, with the visual elements um, that they would see there in that uh, location and sort of connect it uh, with what they uh, saw if they attended the exhibit. And it didn't matter to me if they got it right away. I just wanted to produce something that was recognizable. I also didn't have a ton of time so I <laughs> put them together and I didn't want to, you know, part of um, um, what I've been doing is sort of returning to my roots and working larger scale. So I, I really wanted uh, to take advantage of the opportunity to do something like that um, in a traditional way, you know, with the scaffolding and, and you know, getting on ladders and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, Waking up those old demons that that I had when I was a kid, you know, running around, you know, painting walls in the illegal fashion. <laughs> but again, time didn't allow for it, so mm -hmm. it took the, the easy way out. And uh, I created uh, uh, work by hand, but then I generated it digitally. So the work was actually enlarged in the same way that the banners that were on the facade of the MFA for a short time in the same way that that work was reproduced. So it was digital, hand-drawn, but digital and enlarged to fit the space. You know, you have been really part of bringing hip hop culture to Boston, which is, as you know, it, it's not as diverse of a city as other major cities, um, but, you know, and there's something that has to be said to that because I think it's important that um, this happens, that that people understand this. And you know, you were you were quoted as saying in a, in a different interview, "Hip hop happened; it was not invented." So I want to get what you meant by this, but why it's so important that you bring this type of art uh, culture to the Boston area. Okay, well, two things first. Um, I didn't bring hip hop to Boston, it was already here. <laughs> um, I got caught up in that wave, like so many of us do when we were younger. And it was this, for me, it was this fascination that I had with the birthplace. And everybody knows that's, that's the Bronx, New York. And um, I had relatives that lived out there when I was younger, so I was able to visit and go to and from and, and ride in on the subways, just all, all of those unique, uh, aspects that are um, so much a part of New York City. I, I just was captivated by it ever since I was a teenager. So um, hip hop, you know, this this youth expression and energy. Um, I said that's the you know it was tailor made for for me. Um, so so and so many others that were sort of walking around doing the same things that I was doing when, when we were all teenagers. So I, I definitely did not bring it here, but I, I took advantage of it being here for sure. And um, and the quote, secondly, the quote was by a legendary artist named Phase Two, Lonnie Wood, respectfully. 
he passed away in 2019, right before I began working on, uh, or, or right before I began my residency, or the work for my residency in 2019. He passed away in December. And I, I knew him. I had the privilege of knowing him. He had participated in a couple of our AWOL shows, Artists Without Limits. That's a, a group, uh, artist collaborative collective that we had when I was in art school. Um, shout out to Cape Throw Storm, Rakui Bob uh Dave Taylor, DS7, Chris Barnes, uh, Click One, the whole, the whole crew. Um, so he blessed us with uh, participating in, uh, in an exhibit we had uh, downtown on the waterfront. And this is like decades before that whole area was super developed and, and you gotta be a millionaire to live down there now. But there was this small little modest gallery down there. And um, and uh, we had a three man show. It was uh, the one, Ketro, uh, Storm, and uh, Phase Two. And Phase Two is sort of, he's not sort of, he's, he's a pioneer of hip hop. Um, he wasn't featured so much in the Basquiat exhibit, but he was acknowledged. Um, he rhymed, he, he was a graffiti artist, he's credited with creating a bubble letter. He was painting on subway trains in New York in the, in the late 70s. He was writing graffiti in, uh, not the late, the early 70s, excuse me. And uh, he was writing graffiti in the late 60s. So um, mm. just, just the fact that I knew him. Yeah. So I was sort of mourning his passing um, in December, and I really wanted to do an homage to him as well, but he wasn't as prominently featured in the exhibit as the other artists that I pay tribute to. So that was the business. And it just completely encompasses how I feel about the art from a cultural standpoint. Um, not the art, how I feel about the uh, um, yeah, yeah, as it pertains to my mm -hmm. art, working from a cultural standpoint. And it's just the perfect quote. And it's in capital letters, not. And right. so much of what we see is force fed to us through TV and media and just everyday life. As, and, and everything is manipulated and man seemingly manipulated and manufactured in these days and then presented to us and force fed to us whether we want to consume it or not. So we we have to either get on board or be left behind is is the perception that they create. Mm, mm. Hip hop, no, no one created that. It happened. Right. You know what I mean? It just happened. It was what kids were doing. And right. it became a thing. So it's the perfect quote. And that's how I, I pay respect to my friend, uh, to acknowledge a legend and a pioneer in the movement and the culture. And and, um, and, it, and this also piggybacks on our last discussion where we have to, to, to take advantage of these opportunities as they present themselves to us to really showcase and celebrate what the culture really is and represents. And it's important that we do that because the, and, and I'm, I'm almost echoing the same sentiment from our last conversation. If we don't, because the, the overarching um, uh, optics suggest that people don't really care mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if the culture is preserved properly or not. Um, that's why you have so much misrepresentation. And, and um, we have to, and if we don't uh, celebrate those kinds of efforts and acknowledge those pioneers and those who, who paved the way and laid down a foundation for generations to follow, then we run the risk of losing control of our own culture. And that's, that's right. That's a responsibility. It's a responsibility that I that I put upon myself. So. You know, I want people to say, who said that? And I have his name, clearly, right after the quote yeah. that precedes my write-up of my installation in the, in the Fenway Art Walk. And if I can get people talking, because this generation doesn't know who Phase 2 is. Right, right. You know, if I can get them talking, well, what's, what's Phase 2? What does that mean? 
Mm-hmm. And then all they do, because they're so wired and connected to their devices, all they got to do is just five seconds away from Google, a quick Google search, and you'll know who face to you. Why is preserving the culture of hip hop so important to you? I mean, it, it just, it captivated me. It just dominated, you know, my youth. And I, I think I'm, I'm stubborn, but also fortunate to find a way to infuse it into what I do, or what I was doing as I got older. And um, it's like, uh, sometimes we feel we get to be a certain age and we have to sort of abandon all these childhood, childish whims and, and things that we were into when we were younger. But we don't have to do that at all. I think that's, that's what keeps that spirit within us alive. Mm-hmm. Call it youthful exuberance, whatever you want. But but uh, now nah, you don't have to let it go. As a matter of fact, you better not let it go. You know, it's, especially if it, you know, it if it defines who you are. And hip hop is such a part of me. I almost didn't have a choice. Yeah. So because it was constantly there in the background and infused into every little thing that I was doing. Um, professionally, uh, it, it just sort of became, organically became a part of everything that I was doing, from professional work um, and, and, and the teaching that I did. So that's why it's important, you know, and, and in the, the whole spirit of, of expression and being expressive, it really helps me connect with younger people because, you know, I don't know any young person that doesn't have a really vivid and active imagination. I, mean, I know I did when I was a kid. Right. So you, you tap into whatever they're into. And especially if I'm teaching comics, it's a storytelling medium. Mm-hmm. Every aspect of hip hop is telling a story. It's storytelling. From from the B-boys to to you know the visual component of graffiti. So letting them know that you know, whatever you're into it can be translated and repurposed in this sequential medium because you're just telling a story. You could be into dance, you could be into sports, um, you might collect baseball cards or whatever you're into. You know, there's a story in there and, and you, you just make it as outrageous and as over the top as you possibly can. How has the hip hop culture changed? Is it better? Is it worse? I have my own theory that what we're listening to right now is not hip hop, it's noise. But how has it changed for you? And how how do you try and particularly with your students, get them to understand what true hip hop really is? Well, I'm, I'm what I call a proud dinosaur. So, and what that means is I will, I have no qualms letting the kids I teach know that I am of a certain era and I am like a step away by, by association connected to that first generation. So if we're talking about hip hop specifically, that's one thing. If we're just talking about preference and personal taste, that's another. Because I mm-hmm. tune out of this good stuff. Mm-hmm. It doesn't bother or affect me one way or another. The only time it 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 and I, I don't really let it bother me, but the only time I go back and forth about it is when I see subject matter that I don't believe, and this is how I know I've matured. Because how I know I've grown up. I'm, not, I'm an adult now. <laughs> it it uh, it bothers me when the contact, when the, the the content and the subject matter is being consumed by children mm. that are too young to know about it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I tell this story all the time when I was living in New York. Little Kim's first album. No disrespect to Little Kim, but but 
That's not for 11 and 12 year old girls to get to listen to. It's just not. I'm not saying she doesn't have a right to talk about what she's talking about, but that's for adults or, you, you know, not, not for children. And she did a signing at one of the record stores, the big chains out there. And the line was around the block. And to, to the age of most of those kids out there, which were predominantly young girls, was 10, 11, and 12. And the reporters mm -hmm. were sticking microphones in their faces and saying, well, how, what do you like about little Kim so much? And every last one of them was saying, I like the things that she says. I like how she dresses. And I'm just like, there's the breakdown. Yeah. You know? And if I was 15, I probably wouldn't pay that any mind. But because I'm an adult and, and I teach young, young children and young people, that kind of bothers me. You know, and then there's others I won't name them, but there's others currently. Oh, I, I know who you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Two women in particular had a chart topping song, and I would refrain from, from mentioning the title. But that's the best we can do right, right. now in pandemic times. And these are brilliant women. Mm -hmm. You know? I, I just, you know, it's not for me. So I tune it out. What concerns me is, you know, who's consuming. Yeah. I we, we won't name names, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Listen, I want to turn to your identity or... I should say the way you are known, um, your signature, if you will, ink on paper. What does that mean? Talk about what ink on paper means. Yeah, that was, uh, or it still is, my studio. Um, and ink on paper, I kind of created when I first broke into the comic book industry, the mainstream comic book industry. And I was working for the major publishers, Marvel and DC, Image, Dark Horse, et cetera. And that, that community is so huge. I wanted something that would separate me from other artists. And it's, it's thousands, it's thousands. Talent isn't enough because we don't own talent. Talent runs through us. Um, you know, ability, you know, those are gifts um, that we can either squander or nurture. So. I created Ink on Paper because I viewed uh, finished comic book art as Ink on Paper, and that's what it is, it's literally Ink on Paper. So I, all of the artwork that I would produce, um, we work on 11 by 17 um, uh, Strathmore, Bristol, Bristol paper that are more like uh, art boards, but it's just like heavyweight paper. And we're actually the finished comic book art that they publish is uh, is inked um, pencil art. And I mean, there's we're sort of getting away from a lot of the traditional aspects of it. Um, I'm not as active in the mainstream industry as I was years ago, but um, we're getting away from a lot of the traditional aspects and elements of it, and a lot ushering in a lot more digital and. Um, certain elements of it, um, laying out a page, um, translating um, the sequential uh, pacing of a story onto those large boards is still traditionally done by hand, but a lot of the work after that is, um, is being uh, replaced by, by digital programs, like coloring programs and things like that. And then, um, it's, it's scanned and uploaded to servers, so you're not really shipping any original artwork out of it. So those boards that we maintain or are sent back to us when the books are published, that's ink on paper. Um, and even when I transitioned and started doing more commercial work and working with record labels and such and things like that, even the finished printed product that you would see in a magazine or in a newspaper or wherever, that's still going up on paper. So I felt like it represented everything. It was, uh, it was very broad, a spectrum that covered everything that I was doing or would do. 
because all of it was a form of being on paper. So it stuck and I still represent it. But it was a cool identity and then all of my, all the work that I produced, um, I did the, the bulk of my comic career was, was with Marvel. And um, I did some DC Comics work too, but most of it uh, was with Marvel. And I would always stamp the back of my pages, my original art, and it would have my name and then my logo, which was an ink jar that was turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And then the, the little puddle of ink that would collect on a paper, I spelled out paper in that puddle of ink. So on the ink jar, it said ink, and in the puddle of ink, um, coming from the ink jar, it said on paper. Yeah. So it was a little 3D kind of element, but I, I just made it really crisp and graphic. So it's more more of like an icon, like an emoji before emojis. <laughs> Speaking of icon, and I want to just turn to your dad, Donald Stahl, who you lost over a year ago. And your father was one of the most influential architects in this country and founded the first ever African-American architectural firm, Stahl Associates, and then later Stahl and Lee Incorporated with, of course, David Lee. Did that significance weigh on you growing up? Talk about what you remember with uh, the Stull and Lee and, and your dad and, and these amazing uh, landmarks that he was creating all around the Boston area. Yeah, um, what, a, what an amazing guy. I mean, I'm, I'm still in awe of his, uh, his legacy and um, everything that he represents. Um, and I miss him, I miss him dearly. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of strange. Um, I have such vivid memories of him and you know I'm a product of divorce like a lot of a lot of kids when we were growing up but he he was always accessible and in those early days you know um, he he always allowed me to be uh, close to him like he he always the way I perceived it as a child he always wanted me close to him so it was never a big deal for, for me to be under his desk while he's having a meeting in his office you know as a very young child and you know i'm under there with my, my markers and my crayons and my pencils and my sketch pads and my coloring books and i'm just hanging out having a good old time i'm completely oblivious to the business that was going on um i was just happy that i was near my father and I think sort of that, I don't think, I'm, I'm positive that just being in his presence and being so young, um, a lot of that just planted seeds in me mm. later in my life. And I was always around. It was always activity in the early days of him and forming his business. It was always excitement and there was always all this energy that was constantly going on. And I, I I joked that I was sort of like the office mascot back then. Because I was, I he he uh, he purchased a brownstone on Marlboro Street yep. in the late 60s. And it was four floor uh, brownstone, which would go easily for a bazillion dollars present day. Yeah. We so bought it back then for something like 15 grand. And wow made it his own like a lot of his sensibilities his design sense and uh the way he sees things and conceptualizes things a lot of that was in the interior of the house and there are areas of that of that home that he built by hand um mm. and and that's the environment that i grew up in how lucky how lucky am i where uh all of that kind of brushed off on me and um, I have two uh, sisters and I'm sure uh, it, it affected them um, in ways uh, maybe some similar um, clearly some different my younger sister um, doesn't have much of a memory of those early times um, but but they really affected me and 
I wasn't really conscious of the significance and importance and magnitude of some of the things that he was doing, being a trailblazer. Uh, he was just my father. You know, so all of that came later. And um, I think I went through a period when I was a teenager and trying to find myself creatively and as an artist where I didn't like bringing attention to the, of, of who my father was. I'm trying to figure out who I am. Yeah. Um, that was sort of like a crutch for me because how do you possibly measure up to, you know, a man like that? Mm. And, um, and, and, it, and it, 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 it was a hurt for, for a number of years, but, but I, I acknowledge it every chance I get now. You know, I'm like, wow, I mean, this is where I come from. You know, this is the environment that I grew up in. And it wasn't just my father, his brother. And I, I feel like they're all kind of hanging out, you know, in the afterlife, you know, looking down and watching over us all. But they're all together. You know, mm. my own, by, by, by they, I mean, my, I'm referencing my uncles. His brother um, is my namesake. I was named after him. It's Robert J. Stahl. I'm Robert B. Stahl. And Robert J. Stahl, but he was a, uh, a world-renowned ceramics and taught art at Ohio State University. Yeah. And um, the love for African art and um, educating me on, on, you know, Benin, Benin bronzes and Sinufu, Dan Gary, um, just all the different, you know, tribal carvings and, and the art that was always in the house. Um, just all of that. That's, that was my environment as a kid. And my uncle on my mother's side, um, Mahler Ryder, was a, a drawing instructor at ISD. And, um, and they were resources for me. Mm. And they were easy on me. When I, when I had the balls to step to them and say, I want to be an artist. I want to be like you guys. I mean, how could I not want to be like them? That was, right. that was right. the example I had growing up. So, you know, we may have talked about this before where, you know, what do you want to be? Or who do you want to be when you grow up? And, you know, some kids might want to be like a, a movie star or a basketball player or play football. Or I aspire to be like the people whose work was hanging on my folks' wall. Hmm. Either family members or friends of the family, like Paul Goodnight or Napoleon George Henderson or Nelson Stevens, or Dana Chandler, or Renee Neblet, Barbara Ward, and the list go on and on. What connects all of that is that these were community artists. These were people, amazing creative forces that I had access to through my father and my mother. And, and you know, how could I not <laughs> go, go down this road and ultimately yeah. um, who I've become and who I've become, in my opinion, is just an extension of all of that. How does it feel just driving around Boston and these landmarks that you know your dad is responsible for? I mean, yeah. how does that make you feel? Because they're going to be there for y like years and years and years. Hopefully. They did quick work at the Harriet Tubman house, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's another conversation. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, um, it, it, it feels awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, and, um, I was at the groundbreaking for Harriet Tubman. And I was so young, I, I had little flashes. Um, but he, and that was the, the thing that was the most cool about him, Tony, is he, he always had me around. Like if he was going to, to look at a site, break ground on, on a new uh, assignment or project, I was always there, you know? And, and um, so often you hear stories about how, you know, a mother or a father shut their kid out from, I mean, you know, that's, that's business. You know, that's, that's you know, in some aspects, you can kind of understand 
why that environment might not be the greatest for a young child. But, um, you know, my father, it seemed like he always wanted to have me near him. That's so, awesome. you know, and of course I was, I was completely unconscious of it. There were so many times where I would just like fly in my ear. <laughs> There's a million other places I'd rather be than get to something but dirt and rocks. What what is this? And 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 looking back, man, I thank God for them. Mm. Because they really helped form and shape my character and had such a significant or played such a significant role in my life at that time when I I, I didn't understand any of it. And that's the time when you think about it. Um, it's like the father that was a basketball star putting basketball in his little baby son's hands or baby girl's hands and, and hoping that that child makes that connection by holding that ball. Right. And something will rub off on him. You know, it was, it was kind of, and I'm sure he wasn't even conscious of what he was doing. He was just, hey, I'm just hanging out with my son. And, and everybody acknowledged me. That's, that's Mr. Stull's kid, you know? And, and it was, that was normal life. For all I knew, every other kid in the neighborhood grew up that way. That was just all I knew. And that's what I wanted to do. I aspired to, to someday have my art hanging on somebody's wall, like the art in my parents' house. Your dad, has been described as a having a philosophical approach to designing and I have a quote from him he says I think a bit philosophically in the way I think about design if one is going to design an educational facility it's my view that you first need to ask and answer questions regarding what is education what is learning do you share any of his philosophies when it comes to how you approach your creative work Absolutely, absolutely no question. And I know I get that directly. Um, I'm always looking for uh, connections and, and drawing parallels and identifying um, how things work and, and, and come together. You know, my father armed himself. He, he loved to read. He was constantly reading. He could go through like a 500 page novel in a few days. Um, he had the Holy Bible, uh, the Quran, and a book on Buddhism all on the same shelf. So he wanted to know if, if he didn't follow a particular faith, he still wanted to know and understand it. And, and it brought about this sense of this inquisitive nature within him that I, that I completely share where, um, just being curious about everything. And if you want to have an opinion about something, you have to educate yourself right first. You know, and, and it's it's just, I mean, he was so knowledgeable about so many different things. And, and those are the little things that we have the ability and the power to, to inject in our own lives and, and infuse that with, uh, with other things. What do you miss most about your dad? A lot of things. Um, we went through a period where I would say a tough love period. We weren't necessarily at each other, but in, 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 in it, I had to kind of live through it and live through that, that particular dynamic between us before I could really appreciate looking back and appreciate um, what the tough love uh, signified. And here's a guy through all kinds of adversity uh, who, who made a way when everybody else around him was telling him he was going to fail. And, and he persevered. He stuck to it. And he didn't do it for accolades or patch of back. He, he did it because that's what he was meant to do. And, and, um, and it wasn't without a whole lot of sacrifice, you know, um, but he did it is the most important thing. So, and I would imagine it's like this for any parent, which I unfortunately am not one, 
But, uh, well, I am not one, not unfortunately, I'm not one. But um, I'm sure any parent would, would sort of share in um, the concern um, that your child is living up to their potential or realizing a life for themselves um, that, that they want. Um, you, you, as a parent, I would imagine you would hope you're instilling enough within your children so that they can go off into the world and make a life for themselves and not be dependent on, uh, on, on, on them or anyone. Um, so I think that's where the tough love period in our relationship came from. And he was just looking out, you know, as, as parents would do. It just came in packaged differently, you know. Um, there, it might have been abrasive at times, but it was always delivered with love. And it took me a while to separate it because I am his son. I am an extension of him. So I have a lot of the same personalities and sensibilities that he has. So it was kind of like this at times. But I think when he saw me coming into my own as, as a creative force, and I, it's not that I dismissed a lot of the suggestions and guidance, but I'm a firm believer of you have to find your way in the world and somebody else's way, though successful, might not work for you. Right. So, so, and that's what I would try to articulate to him. And I think that I got, or, or that sensibility, I got a lot from my mother. My mother was very even tempered, laid back. And my father was very format, structured. You do it this way go to high school and graduate, you go to college and then you go to grad school and then you do this. And, and, you know, because I went to art school and got right out, when I graduated, I wanted to get right out into the workforce. I didn't want to, I, I felt like I didn't have the time to go to grad school. I wanted to get this money now. Mm -hmm. so it, it, it's like, you know, you fast forward so many years and then I'm saying, you know, I have this, this, this insatiable desire to teach just like my father did. And then he said, well, if you want to teach, you have to do it this way. You have to do this. You never did all of that. So it's going to be more difficult. And I said, I don't see it that way, Pops. I think if I do this and, and, and turn left here instead of right, and go down that middle road instead of that left that road, then, then I might get to the same place. Um, I might not do it in the time that you did it, but I'll do it in my own time. And um, the beautiful thing before he passed is he saw that. He was able to see that in motion. He was able to see that I stood by my convictions and I persevered and I did things my way, but they were flavored with so much of him that he instantly recognized. But I think it, it, it really made him feel good to see that I had really come into my own and I was able to realize a lot of the things that I wanted to, 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 to do and see for myself. And he saw that, he saw that before he transitioned, so that's. That's beautiful. I wanted to ask you one more question before we close out, um, even though this, that was just such a great way to just pay some, you know, a little bit of a tribute to your dad. And I know you will continue to do so in your work and everything that you do. Um, what's coming up next this year for Bob Stahl? A lot of things I can't talk about. <laughs> well, we'll just have to talk about it next year when we do this again. <laughs> that, that deal, deal. You know, I'm already there. Um, uh, I did do some, some cool things. Uh, I collaborated with, uh, Gigi Sway from Camp Lo, I did some album cover art for him. He's an inspiration. I mean, I think he dropped like three albums last year, solo efforts, away from or independent of Camp Lo. Um, I was featured on the cover of a magazine, Valentated Magazine. Um, I, uh, I really like, uh, you know, shout out to Terrell, Real Life Black, and his whole staff and crew. 
um, they represent exactly pretty much everything we talk about when we talk about hip hop culture from a foundational aspect. And um, I just wholeheartedly support everything they do. They're a magazine. They're are uh, they're a uh, a uh, broadcast platform. They have a, a podcast. They have radio shows, um, and they're really pushing the true elements of the culture. So when they asked me to be uh, uh, to to do the cover story, I, I I jumped at it, and I got introduced to them on Instagram. Um, I'm getting back into the classroom soon. Um, I, I would say I was nervous with everything going on with the pandemic yeah. and all that. It's not so much nervous, if I'm really being honest. Um, there's there's a part of me where, with everything we've all lived through, and again, we, we, we said this before, COVID is the great equalizer. It does not discriminate. Uh, we've all lost people we know to it. Um, it's, it's more like, in spite of all of that, um, and knock on wood, we all remain healthy and vigilant, doing all the things we need to do to stay healthy, but we still got to live in spite of all of that. So I'm eager to get back to, to teaching because I really enjoy it, and I've been away from it for two years now. And, um, you know, as long as we're being smart and sensible, and not listening to misinformation coming from, <laughs> again, I'm afraid from naming names, <laughs> but just continue to apply our own common sense, even when we're, we're being instructed to do the opposite. I think we'll be okay. Yeah. I think I'll be okay. But, but the fear is being replaced and has been replaced by a real desire to just get back to life, you know? Right, just keep right. And not, not get stuck. And, um, you know, we were talking about this in our last conversation again, so many parallels from our last sit down, where, uh, you know, that time to be still and to pause mm -hmm. when it first hit us. Um, in a lot of ways, we both sort of saw it as a gift. Yeah. Time to just sort of catch our breath, recharge, regroup, yeah. and be inspired. And I know for you and me, we, we both acknowledge that uh, it did that for us. Absolutely. The thing is, it, it didn't for others. You know, some people got stuck, and, and um, but, but it really did. It really did recharge and re-energize. So that's what I'm taking. I'm taking into the new year. You know, don't we gotta keep living? We gotta keep moving forward. Well, I am one of your biggest fans, always will be, and I wish you nothing but continued creating and building in this new year. And I look forward to doing this again in season four. Haha. <laughs> again, right back at you. <laughs> Remember, you can listen to the Power Play Show wherever you subscribe to podcasts, including iTunes, iHeartRadio, Pandora Podcasts, and Amazon Music. You can also watch us on our YouTube channel. Simply search the Hull Bay Productions media channel. And be sure to subscribe so you always know when we're live. And we air on BroncoiRadio.com each Saturday at 5 p.m. So be sure to tune into the Power Play Show each Thursday for a new episode wherever you subscribe to podcasts or on our YouTube channel, or simply visit our website, thepowerplayshow.com. Until next time, I'm your host, Tonya McGrath. Happy New Year. Mask up and protect each other.